Uh, so hello everybody and welcome to today's event on the networking channel. We will be having an event today called Digital Twins and Networking, Next Generation Testing and Emulation. It's going to be organized as a panel and it's going to be led by an incredible expert on the topic. Marie Jose Monpetit. She serves as university lecturer at McGill University, where she leads wireless application research in intelligent networking on IoT applications. She is highly decorated uh, member of our community, and her awards include the MIT Technology Review TR10 and Motorola Technology Prize. She is joined by Pedram Johari, principal research scientist at the Institute for Wireless Internet of Things at Northeastern University. He received his PhD from the University of Buffalo and has served as the CTO of an IoT technology startup, as well as having published extensively in the field of IoT. Uh, we're also joined by Ahmed Al-Khatib, assistant professor at Arizona State University. He is the recipient of the 2012 MCD Fellowship from the University of Texas at Austin, the 2016 IEEE Signal Processing Society Young Author Best Paper Award uh, for his work on hybrid pre-coding and channel estimation in millimeter wave communication systems, as well as the NSF Career Award. And we're also joined by Istvan David, assistant professor on the Faculty of Engineering at McMaster University. He has previously served as the head of innovation for a multinational quality engineering corporation and has conducted extensive research on modeling, uh, model transformations and event processing. So uh, before we start, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our next uh, talk in the series. Uh, the networking channel is a series of talks happening every two weeks. And in two weeks, we're gonna have a talk on large ISPs, how do they work? And what are the challenges they face in the engineering and CS skills they need? Uh, this will comprise a panel, uh, including experts from both industry and academia, where we will discuss the internals of large ISPs, their future and open research problems. We hope you will join us. And uh, with that, we're gonna start the panel for today. Uh, one of our goals is to keep things informal, to make it easy for all of you to join and ask questions and guide the conversations towards your interests. And uh, we'd like you to interact, with, uh, invite you to interact with the panelists. Um, all our events are interactive. You can ask questions and use the Zoom Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also enable closed captions if that's helpful for you. And uh, we also have translation in case you would like to see our words translated into your uh, preferred language. And so now I'm going to turn things over to uh, Marie Jose, who's going to be leading the panel. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Actually, you, you're saving me the um, the the burden of having to introduce our uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, so thank you very much again, Matt, for your uh, introduction. And uh, thank, welcome everyone to this uh, this panel on digital twinning. Um, uh, Serge, before we started, was mentioning that this is something we've been talking together for quite a long time. And uh, it's it's interesting that uh, for people like uh, Istvan, who comes from the modeling world, um, digital twins have been there for quite a while. Actually, I've been hearing about digital twinning in um, aerospace and automotive for about 10 years now. But in our world, in our world of networking, they're fairly new. And they have a lot of promise and a lot of challenges. And I think this is what I would like uh, this panel to, to address. And uh, I think Matt is also uh, very uh, right in saying that we would like to have interaction with uh, the people on the call and um, on the call, on the webinar. It's a Zoom call, but it's a webinar too. And uh, you can have to, uh, like also Matt said, you can ask questions on the uh, Zoom Q&A, and also on the uh, Slack channel that is um, associated with the networking channel. So you're not here to, to hear about me, you heard about uh, the the panelists. So um, without, so I, I see you guys in an order of Isvan, um, Bedham and Ahmed, so maybe in terms of a short presentation, we'll do it in that order. So uh, please Isvan, uh, again, for people who just joined, Isvan is a uh, is a new assistant professor at McAt McMaster, and I had the pleasure of working with him when he was a postdoc at the University of Montreal here, and uh, we worked on some IoT and related digital twinning for a very complex system. So, Istvan, please, uh, could you talk a little bit about what you think are digital twins and your experience? Yeah, thank you very much, Marie Jose. Yeah, indeed, we we were. Uh... 
we're building digital twins for strawberries. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, imagine that. Yeah. Digital twins are not restricted to to simple physical systems anymore. Uh, very often, um, you use them to to twin and represent uh, biophysical systems nowadays and more complex systems. So basically, when you talk about a digital twin, uh, the idea is that you have a physical system, right? And uh, you want to build a model of it for a very particular reason. And the reason is uh, you want to collect data and instead of just standing next to the physical thing and observing the physical thing and measuring it and experimenting with the physical thing, you can now move to the digital side of things. And now, now you can have a cognitive um, image, a mental image of the physical twin through the abstractions of models, yeah? So a model in our terms is just an abstraction of reality with a certain purpose. You have a bunch of properties you're interested in. Here, you're not interested in the color of the building, maybe the shape of it, the dimensions of it. You, you abstract away from, from physical reality so that you can tackle the complexity of reasoning about a real physical phenomenon. So for many people, this is where a digital twin stops. The definition of the twin stops here. Uh, this is not a complete picture, of course, because this is just a live model. Yeah. So a digital twin, the most vanilla definition of it, demands that you also have a control in the other way around, right? So you collect data, you do some reasoning on the digital end, and then you exert control. So this is this loop is basically what uh, what digital twin, what a digital twin is, what makes a digital twin. So you have a digital twin on the digital side, and we call the physical system a physical twin. So you have these twinned artifacts you can you can experiment with, you can reason about, and. Um, yeah, so there are two big ways to have a look at this. Yeah, so most most people, some people come from the modeling world, like I do, and and we worked on live models, so models at runtime, and that that these things have been there for decades, and there are people coming from the mechanical domain or mechatronics who look at this as basically a smart uh, closed loop control. So was was the big thing about this, right? So basically, the the old ideas in a new form. Um, of course the advanced digitalization and digital transformation that we've seen we've been seeing out there in industry gave rise to 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 uh to these systems and now building digital tweets is actually a feasible uh feasible thing um we talk about models yeah you can think of any model yeah so for some people it's something discrete like a like a queuing network or, or an automaton or you know graph for some people it's a bunch of differential equations for some people in very, very extremely niche domains, it's a bone graph. So anybody here <laughs> working with bone graphs, please let me know. Uh, so ve very much, uh, it's, it's a very wide a set of, of possible representations you can choose from. And yes, it is advised actually in the spirit of multi-paradigm modeling that you choose the most appropriate formalisms, the most appropriate languages to describe your abstractions of the physical world. And the most appropriate uh, abstraction and language and formalism is, of course, um, whatever suits your needs. Yeah? Um, you typically equip your digital twin with a simulator or some sort of an advanced real-time uh, reasoning mechanism so that you can um, take the human out of the loop and the reasoning is actually uh, carried out by the machine or the computer itself. And, uh, and the control can be uh, sort of autonomous. And uh, yeah, digital twinning has been a transformational trend in, in many domains, typically uh, in, in automotive, smart cities, but nowadays we see smart agronomy and apparently also uh, network engineering and network design. So this is fantastic. Um, there are different definitions, just, just showing you basic definitions. So we talk about digital twin when we have a, this bi-directional uh, link, right? We have data coming here and control going there. Some people like to distinguish uh, uh, between digital twins and digital shadows. Yeah, when you have a data coming to the digital side uh, and the control is manual. Some people call this a digital shadow. Sometimes you, you, can, you can put the human in the loop and you can build human actuated digital twins where you generate a bunch of instructions and the human with their intelligence can decide, well, I, I sort of believe this is safe, this is secure, this is, this is actually something I can do with my system. And I won't burn this this building uh, following these instructions, yeah? Uh, and basically you have a digital mo model when you don't have data coming in. So indeed the key element when you build a digital twin is data coming at you at, at real time with, you know, in large volumes and then you, you, you exert control. And there are many different 
frameworks to 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 um to um you know position your 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 setup but something very interesting that's probably closer to to the wireless um and, and network emulation testing world is is this uh this emerging topic of digital uh quadruplets yeah? some people say well you have a physical system you build a model of it just to visualize it in 3d 2d whatever suits your needs this is your digital twin and then you have a digital triplets models you can use to analyze your your physical twin but this is not always enough sometimes you want to build a quadruplet yeah a, th a third representation of the reality which is an actual physical model scale down a simplified model of physical reality so that gives you massive uh, advantage you know uh, when you want to experiment with virtual and physical things so you can bring the, the hardware in the loop but you also have advanced uh, digital reasoning capabilities so this is just to show you the many definitions of digital twins and yeah Pedram and Ahmed will show you uh, how they make use of these uh, these these um, these well models of, of a digital twin yeah why is this important uh there's no going back to the old ways right so digitalization gave a rise and digital transformation gave rise to these these techniques and this year marks the first when uh the nominal gdp driven by digital transfer transfer companies um is is higher than you know digitally non transformed companies so we see this trend and if you read the gartner reports you see digital twins and derived concepts popping up on the hype curve and uh, yeah, we see uh, many of the digital twin related topics reaching the plateau and becoming important assets for, for companies out there. So uh, so we are quite there now. Um, just a word about what are we doing with, with digital twins in, in our lab. Um, we are a systems engineering uh, lab and uh, what we are very much interested in is the end-to-end -end life cycle of, um, of systems and how you can put digital twins around these activities. So we will talk about Ahmed and, um, and, and Pedro will talk about mostly uh, testing emulation, so these phases, but what you might be also interested in is uh, you know, using a digital twin to collect data along the engineering life cycle and uh, use the data in operation yeah so optimize it real time but also to retire your system and you know think about how you can reuse all the data and actual knowledge you accumulated along the life cycle so this is what we this is what we um, um investigate here in the sustainable systems and methods lab at mcmaster university um this is important about 60 percent of organizations believe digital twins will be critical in improving their sustainability efforts and these are trends probably also um, channeling into into the network uh, domain so keep an eye on that perhaps i think this is basically it i hope this gave you right ideas about what digital twins are i think uh, if you have questions uh, just feel free to ask them in the chat and i pass back the token to marie jose Thank you so much. Yeah, I think it was a great introduction for the next two speakers. So we'll uh, now ask uh, Pedram to talk a little bit about what they've been doing in Coliseum. Uh, I know, actually, I'm on your mailing list. Uh, I know a lot about Coliseum because it's one of the power projects, and I'm also collaborating with one of the power projects at our, uh, Iowa State University called ERA, where we do, uh, and we hope to be doing digital twins too. Uh, in in the wireless world. So, Pedram, uh, maybe you want to start sharing your slides and take over from here. Of course. Uh, thanks, Marty, and thanks, Stevan, for setting up the floor. Um, let me start with sharing the slides, and we can take it from there. Please let me know if you can see the slides. Yes, we do. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, um, again, as uh, Marty mentioned, um, you know uh, the, the work that we have been uh, doing on digital twins. Uh, is primarily around our uh, wireless network testbed platforms. Um, and um, again, focused on Coliseum. Um, what I have today um, in this presentation is mostly you know, uh, a brief introduction about this testbed platform and how uh, we envision uh, to um, advocate for digital twins using wireless network emulators uh, with hardware in the loop. Uh, Coliseum, uh, just as a brief introduction, is the world's largest wireless network emulator. Um, as of right now, as of today, it has 25 racks of uh, computers and radios. It has 256 software-defined radios, uh, and it has a fabric of FPGAs 
which we call them MCAM or Massive Channel Emulation System, uh, which essentially takes care of emulating uh, RF scenarios uh, for you at the baseband, uh, but connected to uh, software defined radios for the communication part. It also has uh, NVIDIA DGX uh, GPUs. Uh, at this stage, we have two of them, each with eight GPUs, uh, uh, the A100s, that's the state of the art GPUs with NVIDIA, and that supports uh, AI native applications for um, you know, um, a variety of different applications in wireless that these days will see the nexus of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and wireless networks and IoT. So that part is a component that we've added in the past year to make sure and that users do have um, access to the state-of-the-art GPUs to do uh, AI training uh, and inference. Um, and of course, everything is backed by a software-defined network infrastructure with Sonic uh, that takes care of the networking. What you see um, down here is a, is a high-level overview of the structure of Colosseum. It has four quadrants with software radio nodes. So those are the SRNs. Each of the nodes do have a dedicated computer. Uh, it's a Dell server connected to a software-defined radio by NI. That's X310 with two radio front ends. That creates uh, the environment for users to go ahead and, you know, put in their radio protocol stack. And those are software-defined radios. So you can essentially um, install any type of radio on them. Uh, these days, we are primarily focusing on open and programmable radio access networks, uh, the, the notion of ORAN. But we do have containers that are ready to use for all the users uh, with uh, Wi-Fi protocol stack, with SRS RAN, uh, with, you know, 5G, 3GPP. Uh, compliance uh, protocols, um, as well as, you know, some of the other technologies, LoRa, uh, just to name a few. Um, and then um, we have a, uh, you know, protocol tuning uh, framework uh, that can take care of, you know, a, a live and real-time connection to a GitHub repo, uh, which can be open source, or it can be a private repository of, of the users. And then what happens in, in, in this Colosseum, which we call the you know, digital tween, essentially automatically, uh, periodically, it will just fetch the new version of your code. It will install it on the radios and you can use them on the fly. Um, that being said, uh, this is uh, just uh, you know, a snapshot of uh, some of the results that we have been able to achieve by using Colosseum. Uh, and enabling it as a tool for digital tweening. What you see on the left side is an outdoor environment. This is a collaboration that we did with the U.S. Department of Transportation uh, for a V2X scenario. Uh, as you can see on the top left, uh, there's the actual real, real world scenario with the streets and whatnot. And then on the bottom, we have created a 3D model of that. Uh, we have uh, done ray tracing uh, to create the channel models. And then that has been installed on Colosseum. And as we can see, we can, you know, emulate uh, mobility of the vehicles. Uh, we can have all those, um, uh, you know, pe peculiarities of the channels by ray tracing. Or instead of that, we can always, uh, you know, replace that by stochastical channels. Um, and then users can essentially repeatedly uh, run uh, the experiments that they want. They can, on top of that, they can, you know, uh, install their, their protocol stack. And, uh, for example, if they want to do some deep reinforcement learning, um, uh, to optimize um, some of the components of the network. They can do that on digital training, they can do the testing, and then they can deploy it in the real world. On the right side, on the middle column, uh, there's an indoor environment that's called Arena. That's one of the other testbed platforms that we have at Northeastern. We, uh, in an effort, we have created a digital train version of that indoor environment, also on Calcium. Uh, that lets users to, um, you know, have more accessibility and they can repeat uh, the scenarios with the exact uh, same conditions as many times as they want. And they can make some augmentations for do, for just to do data collection. Uh, that's an, a necessity for, for, for AI to, uh, training. And of course, the graphs that you see is essentially showing you a high fidelity uh, tweening uh, feature of, 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 of whatever happens in Colosseum compared to what happens in the real world. It's a perfect match. Um, uh, we have tools uh, that can do channel sounding on Colosseum, uh, which is a wireless network emulator. Um, this is the same practice of channel sounding in real world, but we do that on Colosseum, but with emulated radios. Uh, and we have been able to demonstrate uh, that the channel that you sound on this uh, larger scale wireless network emulator is a perfect match to what happens in the real world. Um, the same graph here, just to um, point out a few extra, um, you know, um, important notes. Um, again, consider Colosseum as a um, as a 
tool um, that is publicly available um, to the researchers. Um, and of course, we have spent a lot of time, uh, back to what Stephen uh, was mentioning in his uh, presentation, we have spent a lot of time to make sure that this, we can, uh, you know, accurately uh, emulate the wireless environment or what we call it the virtual RF scenario. So that's a key component as uh, Isfam was mentioning and Ahmed is gonna talk about that as well with, with simulation. So that's what we think is the building block. Uh, you have to have a fully representative version of your physical world in your virtual domain. But that the story does not end there. Um, you know, we are in the business of working on wireless network uh, systems and we would like to have, uh, you know, additional components. So uh, on top of, you know, that that building block, that physical layer, we have developed, uh, you know, full protocol stack. Um, this, this is just an example of UEs on the left side and then base stations on the right side. And then on top of that, of course, you can have your applications with the notions in the ORAN, uh, for example, the DApps is in the ocean that we are, we are working on at the physical layer that, uh, that enables real-time distributed applications with AI, uh, with native AI and ML, uh, so that you can, you know, receive um, IQ samples, play with them, train AI, do the inference, uh, and then emulate everything on that, on that uh, virtual domain. Um, and of course, on top of that, um, uh, you know, there's there's the service management orchestration that, take, that takes care of near real-time and non-real-time uh, apps uh, in the open program of what, uh, cellular networks. Uh, and we have a, a very comprehensive library of RAN intelligent controllers or RICs uh, that are interconnected uh, with, with this, this entire platform. And of course, that utilizes the GPUs that I was explaining in, in, in the previous slide to enable the AI and ML applications. Um, real quick here, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but just, um, you know, this is an overview of what we call a um, open 5G or open 6G um, uh, reference structure. Uh, what you see here, we have a, a run in the box, uh, which is a complete radio access network with, um, you know, fully programmable, open, softwareized, and virtualized. Um, full protocol stack. And then on the left, uh, we have, you know, we have the open RAN gym uh, that's essentially taking care of, uh, there's, there's, there's a full library of these protocol stacks that people can use them. But of course, it also has libraries with, with, with RIC, non-real-time and real-time. And it has an orchestrator uh, uh, and uh, management system that will take care of, uh, you know, uh, deploying um, and um, utilizing some of these apps and showing how they perform in, a, in an emulated network. That being said, on the bottom, um, as uh, Mari was mentioning uh, at the beginning of this call, um, what we do on Colosseum is all based on uh, virtualized Linux containers. And that's the beauty of the system. So you can test that in your digital twin which is on Colosseum, but you can take that Linux container and then put it on uh, real world testbed platforms. So it's pretty flexible. We can move that to Arena, for example, that's an indoor testbed environment with over the air antennas. That's a real world testbed exper experimental testbed platform. And then after that, you can also uh, do, uh, you know, some, uh, some performance testing in, in larger scale testbed platforms, including the uh, um, the power platforms, which is the platform for advanced wireless research uh, uh, platforms that has uh, at this point, uh, four different locations fully deployed in, in, in real world uh, cities. Um, and you can pr uh, pretty much migrate, you know, the, this, this containerized protocol stack of your wireless system uh, from the digital twin to the real world. And then we have demonstrated uh, that the results um, are a good match um, and um, you know um, you don't have to spend millions of dollars doing testing and development in the real world but you can do that in the digital twin and then once it's ready you can deploy it in your real world. Um, I think at this point I will stop right here to give um, also Ahmed a um, little time to go over his presentation. Thank you very much uh, and I like the way you actually hit a really important point for for everybody on this on this panel and the, uh, on online is this idea that you don't have to spend you know millions of dollars of infrastructure to be able to test things and i think this is something that we're going to come back to and i think Ahmed also mentioned some of that uh, which is one of the big advantages of, of moving to the virtual world so Ahmed, please all right so last but not least <laughs> 
Yeah, so so uh, you, you see the slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. Let me just hide the control here. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so hello everyone again, and thanks Mary for the invitation. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, so essentially what I would like to kind of briefly uh, talk about is our vision for um, uh, not just digital twins, but but what we think could be real-time digital twin uh, assisted communications. And this this work has been done with jointly with my students and has been funded by NSF and a number of industry grants. So, uh, and our actual motivation uh, for for our vision for real time digital twins start from starts from actually the physical layer. So, if you look at the current trends in communication systems, so two key trends are the use of large antenna arrays. So, going from MIMO to massive MIMO at sub six or millimeter wave terahertz MIMO or cell free massive MIMO or intelligent services. So all, all, all are different ways, right, of using large antenna arrays. And in fact, if we want to keep scaling the data rates and we need to keep scaling these MIMO systems. And another key trend is the increasing dependency on higher frequency bands, so going from sub six gigahertz to millimeter wave in, in, in 5G and potentially sub terahertz in uh, 6G or beyond. So if you look at these key trends in communication systems, so they are mainly driven by the need for higher data rates, but they come with many other challenges for mobility, reliability, latency, and energy efficiency. So if you have these large antenna arrays, for example, they will have a large channel matrices. And in order to really leverage uh, these, these MIMO systems, we need to estimate the channel. And the estimation of these large channel uh, matrices typically um, needs a lot of training, pilot training, overhead and feedback overhead, which makes it hard for these systems to support mobility. Uh, also, as we go to uh, higher frequency bands, then the lengths become very sensitive to blockages and become more line of sight and very sensitive to blockages. So, uh, which again, challenges the reliability of the network and as well as uh, also um, the latency. So if, if the link is, is blocked, for example, and disconnected, then this user needs to hand off to another base station, which may uh, anchor some latency, uh, in addition to energy efficiency and the different components of the network, as well as uh, the, the mobile user side. So if you look at all these challenges, and then you can very broadly say that if we have a way to acquire the channel knowledge between the different nodes in the network in a kind of in a genie added way, right? I mean, without consuming a lot of wireless communication resources, then this can address many of these challenges, for example, mobility, I mean, if the base station and user uh, knows the channel, then they can directly design beamforming vectors. They can even with high mobility. Uh, if the and also if if they know the channel not just at the current moment, but maybe um, in the next few hundred milliseconds, then you can maybe the network can proactively predict that the link is going to be blocked uh, in the you know the next maybe hundred milliseconds and can make some proactive action. For example, proactively moving this user to another base station or to uh, be switched to another beam. So basically, we can do a lot of uh, um, actions and proactive actions to uh, to enhance the reliability latency uh, of the network. So with that motivation, so we we, we thought of this idea of, of basically real-time digital. Code. So if you imagine there is a vehicle in this city that's in, in, a, in a downtown, um, then it if it doesn't have any knowledge about basically, I mean, uh, about the environment, then the classical way, which is what's currently deployed is that this user will, uh, if it wants to connect to a base station, then it will just initiate, uh, in, you know, we'll, we'll look for maybe SSB beams or uh, initial access process and will take a lot of time to connect and also will take a lot of time to find best beam for data traffic and so on. Now imagine if this if this uh, mobile vehicle has, has access to may, either on device or at the edge or cloud to a 3D map of its environment including the location of the of the base station and maybe some information also about the antenna panel and so on. And using and by fusing some multimodal sensing information from whether the vehicle itself or maybe the infrastructure, then this this, this digital twin of the, uh, or, or this 3D map now becomes real-time 3D map. So it has also access to or knowledge about the, the dynamics in, in, in the environment. So this real-time 3D map of the environment then again, that's available device, edge or cloud, depending on the latency requirements and complexity and so on. Uh, then this, I mean, theoretically, at least this UE can run uh, real-time ray tracing 
to know not necessarily the channel matrix exactly, but at least some you know information about the channel dimension. So for example, it will know that the, the main channel subspace is probably you know going from this direction, or maybe these are the best uh, subset of beams that I need to search over instead of searching everywhere. And this can dramatically reduce the uh, the channel acquisition overhead, and then again address many of these challenges that I mentioned. And uh, even though this this may look futuristic, but if we look at um, the current trends in in in, uh, in in technology, so if we uh, you know with, with the advances in precise three D maps and uh, high fidelity sensing, which is available now in in autonomous vehicles and soon in, in AR VR and other devices. Um, then it, it, it may not be hard in the future to fuse this multimodal sensing information that are again acquired by different sens sensors distributed in the network and infrastructure and, and also mobile, mobile devices or users in general in the, on, into these uh, 3D maps to have more or less real-time 3D maps of the environment. And then also with the advances that we see in uh, not just ray tracing, but real-time ray tracing, which is already... Um, you know, getting commercialized by some by some companies. So running real time ray tracing on real time three D maps is this essentially you know gives us uh, um, directly a real time digital twin of the physical wireless communication environment, right? And this is this is important to clarify here that in 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 in, in what we at least are interested in is that we are looking at not a digital twin of just a network, we're looking at also a digital twin of the physical environment, the, the 3D maps, the buildings, the cars, and so on. Um, and now with the advance also of machine deep learning, it can enhance the different uh, aspects of, of like uh, of these three components, right? The, the maps, the multimodal sensing, the, the fusion uh, of all the sensing information, the processing and so on, and the ray tracing as, as well as could be AI enhanced. All right, now you can think of different uh, you can think of this in different ways, like how to, uh, or different levels, this digital twin. So either that every, in, in a very kind of a local uh, or, or a very kind of, let's say, simple way. So this device could just have a local uh, digital twin. So that's only accessed by, uh, by uh, that, it, that it is only basically a device that has access to it. So for, again, on device, edge or cloud, and it fuses this digital twin with its local sensing information. And then also it uses this, uh, this digital twin to make its own decision. And then every device basically will have digital twin. Or in a more kind of maybe interesting way, you can think that all these devices will jointly fuse their sensing information and will have access to a global digital twin, maybe at the edge or cloud. And they will fuse their sensing information to this digital twin to build like a more, again, uh, global and more... Uh, um, uh, rich digital, rich or digital twin, and then jointly or separately uses digital twin either again to make just separate decisions, or in the very kind of uh, advanced ways, they can also do joint decisions for both sensing and communication. For example, if two if two devices are close, they don't need to do the, to sense the same environment again. They can maybe coordinate the sensing decision as well as also they can co coordinate the communication decisions. For example, to do some distributed optimization. Now, this can be interesting for many applications or even though like started by motivating this for physical layer uh, because the channel knowledge can uh, directly enhance channel prediction, uh, beam, beam assignment, beam management and so on. But you can also think that this could have a lot of interesting applications to higher layers and, and, and service, service migration, proactive caching and many other interesting applications in the higher layers as well. Now, in order to do any research in these directions, we need to do to have um, a digital uh, a research platform that that has both the the, uh, the the real world actually measurements and the synthetic version of of these measurements. So it's kind of a digital trend. And for that, we with this motivation, we built this uh, research platform that we call Deepverse Six G, which will be available soon. And it's based on our previous work on on, on Deep MIMO, which is a completely synthetic data set for wireless communication. And uh, DeepSense, which is a data set we published uh, last year that has more than 1.5 million uh, multimodal sensing and communication uh, data points. And we built diverse scenarios to be synthetic versions or digital twin uh, versions of DeepSense. So for example, this is one uh, scenario that we have now, which we essentially on the left, you see the, uh, the, the real world measurements that are coming from our DeepSense data set, which is publicly available now. 
And on uh, the second column, we show basically the digital twin replica of this uh, of this uh, of the same scenario. And again, this digital twin replica is not just um, by mimicking the visual representation of of the of the real world. It has also we also modeled. We measured, for example, the uh, the, the beam patterns of the uh, of the phased arrays that we have been using at the base station. We incorporated this model in the digital. So it's kind of it's a model of the different aspects of the environment, of the environment as well as uh, the uh, the hardware uh, devices we have. All right, we have also uh, again uh, uh, digital, uh, basically multimodal sensing information from lidar, radar, position, and uh, other modalities. So. Essentially, with that, we, we think the digital twin could be interesting, of course, for testing and emulation, but also could be interesting for real-world communication operation. So it can, uh, if, if in the real time, if this if the, if the communication network has access to this digital twin, then it can make uh, actions, maybe not like exactly real time, but maybe near real time, for example, for the next uh, few hundred milliseconds, it can uh, enable the network to make, again, proactive actions for handoff, for user association scheduling, um, proactive uh, B management uh, uh, and more. So with that I stop here and look for I look forward to our uh, discussions. Yeah, actually, you uh, again uh, touched a number of topics that I think are uh, extremely important. This idea of the twins of twins, and I think Istvan will relate to that because the project we did had a twin of twins. Actually, there was two, at least two parts to it. So I think that is a very important uh, aspect of of especially on complex communication systems that it's really almost impossible to do the twin of everything, but you can actually do the twin of some parts and then. Uh, be able to have them, like you said, communicating. So since Ahmed, you were the last person to to talk, you'll be the first person. I'll ask a question. Uh, you you know what you presented is is extremely uh, uh, exciting and and actually very very impressive. Uh, but what were the challenges uh, that you express you uh, you had when you were developing this? And Pedram and and and. Um, and Istvan, you also have probably some opinions about this, but I'll start with Ahmed. So was it so the I, I know, for example, the access to the real-time data is often a big issue, the modeling itself, uh, the latency because you need to compute things. So what in in your uh experience, what were the biggest challenges? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Maria. This is a great question. So in in uh, and to both it, maybe in, also in, in the context context of what we think. Um so once we have these real-time digital twins, or or, or uh, again this data collected from the real world, we can of course use these digital twins either to pre-train machine learning models for the actual system operation, or to use them for uh, for real-time inference. Right. So now for the challenges, I mean, of course, it becomes more and more uh, interesting and also challenging when we talk when we think of these uh, digital twins as real-time digital twins that can help the communication network that's actually operating. Uh, now, right? It's not not just to kind of for 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 preparing or 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 or, or um, designing the network. Um, so, in order for this to happen, now of course we need to have like uh, you know, uh, I mean, moving, uh, building basically these digital twins in real time and fusing the sensing information in real time to uh, update and maintain these digital twins. This is challenging for many from many aspects, right? I mean, we need to. Um, you know, figure out also how to, to 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 transfer all this data that maybe from different sensors, and in a way that is eventually efficient for also the communication. So if we are building this digital twin to help communication, then moving also all this sensing information will have a lot of uh, data communication, uh, you know, uh, burden on the communication network. So. So a lot of like uh, you know compression of the sensing information, uh, maybe distributed learning, semantic communication, semantic uh, uh, communication. How to basically focus on extracting the important information from all these sensors, and then to reduce the data traffic uh, for updating and maintaining these digital sensors. This is one aspect. Another challenge, of course, is also on the modeling of of these digital twins. So, so if we are going to use these digital twins to help the communication network. Then this 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 digital twin need to be calibrated over time, to be making you know close predictions to what the network will actually see in terms of, for example, the wireless communication channel in reality or at least the channel subspaces. So this modeling is 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 not trivial. So how would you model all the way from the three D model of the environment, the the geometry, 
all the way to uh, the modeling of the um, uh, uh, of the electromagnetic you know properties of the different walls and and surfaces uh, so that the, so that we can do actually uh, um, you know meaningful ray tracing and then all the way to to the ray tracing itself which needs also to be calibrated based on the environment um, Pedro, that, do you want to, to chime in on this yeah. sure of course i think um uh, Ahmed is raising uh, really good points as far as you know uh, um, the, the the size of the data that we need to communicate between the twins uh, uh, can be really critical uh, you know to to design an efficient way that you know most probably you, will, you may not to transfer all that information but you know there are critical information that digital twin needs to know so that it can help uh, with for example if you're training an AI model you need to have some information from what is happening in the real world so that you can fine tune your results and then communicate those control messages back to the real world. So that's uh, definitely one of the challenges. But, um, you know, from from where we look at this problem, um, you know, um, as you very well know, Mari, um, you know, we are focusing on uh, real world um, wireless test platforms with actual radios. Um, and, you know, often than not, when you're looking at a large scale, um, you know, network, um, think about AT&T's Verizon's of the world, uh, they have deployments uh, in the real world with base stations and many and many of users. And then you want to have a realistic, you know, digital twin version of that. And now we're thinking about having real uh, radios in the loop. And uh, that by itself, uh, um, you know, can be quite challenging in terms of being able to emulate uh, larger scale uh, systems, which Colosseum is actually doing uh, with 256 radios, uh, which is quite large compared to you know, other test platforms. Uh, and then, you know, there, there's that bottleneck of, uh, you know, being able uh, to process, because, you know, when you're out there, every single UE, they do have their own processors. You know, it's it's sort of a community resource that's that comes together with that, you know, larger scale um, physical world, but putting that together in a room with all the compute that you need, all the radios that you need, and making sure that in real time it can react to whatever happens in 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 the in the in the real world. I think that's one of the critical challenges that these days we are trying to, um, you know, attack. Uh, making sure to make that real time connection between the twins that Ahmed um, uh, is spending, I think, uh, a large portion of their time doing all these great work, making sure uh, that there's a meaningful connection between the tweens rather than just having an offline version of replaying uh, a model that has happened already in the past in, in, in the real world without with, with lack of the information of what is happening right now at the moment. I think these are these are these are critical um, um, challenges to be to, to be looked at and you know resolved. Um I will switch to the Q&A. There's actually two questions that are related to the same, a little bit of the same topic. And I will uh, push those questions to Istvan since he comes from University of Montreal, the powerhouse in AI ML in the world right now. Um, so one question, and I think both are related. One says, you know, how can LLMs can be used in digital twins? And the other one is what are the principal models uh, that uh, use AI ML for building digital twins? I was going to answer, but I will let Istvan do the answer because for me, the AI ML is, is tested on the twins, but um, it could be another answer too. So Istvan, please. Yeah, I mean, I will start with the uh, with the LLM part. Um, these are very, two very distinct topics, right? LLMs and digital twins, but there's a, there's a very specific challenge um, uh, in digital twinning is, is the question of autonomy. Uh, so first of all, you have to have the ability, the twin has to have the ability to actuate the system. Yeah, You have to instrument your physical system accordingly, but that's not enough. Um, the human, the human stakeholder also has to build a certain trust and give the, uh, the, the, um, the ability and the liberty, more like it's so a liberty to act. Yeah, so you can, you should, at some point, you should let the twin make decisions without you in the loop, because you, as a human, you're the bottleneck in this. So the way to, to build trust uh, in, in, in digital twins, one way is to understand uh, how the decisions are being made. So you might want to get the decisions and, and the, you know, chain of thought being explained to you. So some people work on, on using LLMs to actually generate explanations of uh, of, of you know chain of thought uh, you know the, the digital twin 
um, it has when make certain decisions. So that's that's one way to to combine LLMs and real things. But this is a very niche niche problem, and there are there are more important challenges right now in individual twinning, uh, as emphasized by Ahmed and, and Pedram. Uh, related to scalability, maintainability, and then maybe verification and certification. About uh, the second question, what are the principal models for building digital twins? So I can tell you about our experience. Um, so if you build, if you have a complex system, a complex physical system, and you want to build a complex, you want to build a simulator of it that is faithful enough to, to simulate the you know, complex properties of the physical system, the, the simulator itself will be super complex. So it is very challenging to build and maintain a simulator you know, manually. So what we investigated was, how about you build a rudimentary model of your aesthetic model uh, of reality? You call that like the, the first version of your digital twin, and then you augment your digital twin with learning capabilities. So how about you use reinforcement learning in your digital twin to observe how the physical system changes as you actuate it? So, you, so in the digital twin, you have you're on a simulation, you say, okay, this is what I expect to happen if I do this in the physical world. So you you, you, you check what, how your expectations align with the actual change in the physical system. And as you get closer, as the physical system's behavior, the trace gets closer to what you have in your simulations, at some point it's, it's, it will get so close through gradual refinements of your simulator that you might say, okay, now I believe this is it's a quite faithful simulation and a quite faithful representation of reality. So we use reinforcement learning, for example, to learn simulators of digital twins. So this is one direction of using AI for digital twins. And then what my Jose already um, mentioned in a half of a sentence, and that actually um, Pedro also mentioned uh, the other direction. How can you use digital twins for learning? So Pedro mentioned you can use digital twins for reinforcement learning, right? So what you can do is instead of actuating the physical thing and just going to the physical thing, which might be costly, dangerous, yeah, not too secure, not too safe, um, you can take the physical, the digital twin. And if you believe that the digital twin is a faithful enough representation of the physical reality, how about you generate a bunch of data using the digital twin? You can generate a bunch of data for deep learning, or you can generate data in an interactive way for reinforcement learning. So this question of AI and digital twins, it goes both directions. So it's, I'm just very impressed whenever I see such solutions out there. And apparently uh, Colossium uh, uh, has these solutions. It's fantastic. Um, there's a question that's much more uh, specific to Ahmed. Uh, it comes from Professor uh, Mohamed Salim at Iowa State. Uh, he says, um, given that LIDARs are, are provide higher accuracy, uh, compared to radar system, do you still uh, use radar in your multimodal sensing? And that actually is an important question uh, related to another question I had, which was like, what, how do you get the data? How do you make sure that you have the right data? So, um, and that's, yeah, so I keep telling my students the answer to all the questions and we need more data. But uh, so Ahmed, how would you answer the LIDAR versus radar question? Yeah, this is just a very good question. And um yeah, we have been working on this kind of multimodal sensing aided communication, which is kind of uh, is actually what also led us to digital twin at the end, where we use different sensing model modalities to directly help communication uh, network like beam management, channel prediction, block prediction, things like that, handoff and so on. Um, and yeah, of course we you know like there's always this kind of you know which modality is more valuable. I mean, it's position, maybe position information could be enough. Or do we need uh, to have more, uh, you know, information about the environment? Maybe visual data, all the way to visual data, but uh, which will give us a lot of information. But uh, or or lighter or radar. Uh, and I think that every modality has its own uh, advantages and 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 limitations. So, for example, if we look at uh, lighter, and give of course more information about maybe the uh, uh, depth information in the environment. Uh, vision gives you more richer information about, you know, the moving objects and so on. Uh, radar gives us also more information about uh, Doppler and micro Doppler. And so if we are interested in kind of, you know, a lot of kind of information, again, from Doppler processing and so on, then right, radar is interesting. The other uh, maybe dimension that's also important when we look at these modalities is just from practical uh, perspective, the, the, uh, the privacy concerns, right? So if you 
if you you know you cannot deploy visual uh, visual cameras or cameras everywhere or lidar also everywhere so in some scenarios uh, maybe um, the information that we get from radar or even wireless sensing could be uh, sufficient for the communication uh, objective and also preserve, you know, uh, uh, basically has less uh, uh, concerns from privacy uh, perspective. So it's, it's a trade off between the technical, you know, the information that every modality can give us and also the uh, other limitations from privacy and computational cost and uh, and cost also the cost of the of the hardware equipment itself okay thank you well so continuing in some of the questions that we had prepared um you know one of the reasons that we organized this was this idea that you know the world is going software and however there is still something that is very hardware uh, oriented it's all system testing especially in wireless communication so um one of my uh, questions would be, and I would start with Pedro I'm on this that's for this time. Um, what do you think of of using DTs for for system testing? And and what I I read in somebody somebody else has said that you know that the future of system testing was email us your digital twin and keep your equipment at home. Uh, how do you see this? Uh, is this going to arrive in our in our lifetime, or the, what are the major challenges to that? And, well, and it goes back to what it goes back also to what uh, Isvan mentioned. Uh, you know, your twin needs to become so good, and you, then it really gives into the the, the the reinforcement learning and stuff. But yes, so the question is, when can I start emailing my digital twin uh, for for system certification? That's a great question, Mari. And uh, you know, this this is one of the very interesting um topics if you will that you know people start to talk about okay so so what's what's going to be next what's going to be future is when is going to be this future that you're talking about there's going to be digital twins that are functional and working and fingers crossed what will happen in our lifetime that's our goal <laughs> so um i'm older uh, than you so maybe my lifetime would be this long <laughs> well i think we are not too far <laughs> from each other but anyways um, so, but, you know, I, I, I want to connect this to your first part of the question, talking about, you know, things are going software versus hardware. Of course, there's dependencies to the hardware. Um, as we speak right now, we are hosting uh, this, you know, open area interface uh, um, and open source uh, communities of Foreign Alliance today at Northeastern. Well, you know, we have uh, people from, from large industry who are actively talking about this. So it's, what is this virtualization? Uh, you know, removing the dependency to the hardware, working on the software protocol stacks, and then being able to deploy the, uh, you know, the, those software oriented solutions uh, that people come up with on, you know, any type of hardware. So it's going to be hardware agnostic, but there's going to be the software. And of course, digital twin comes to play because, um, you know, there's this whole concept of interoperability between the different uh, hardware and also integration of the software and hardware and the virtualization. Um, our goal here with the wireless network testable platforms that we have, including Colseum, is, you know, you know, pushing the limits of digital twins towards a fully open, programmable and a smart, you know, wireless network with hardware in the loop, which is agnostic to the to the specific hardware that we use in the digital twin. And that goes back to the last the slide that I was showing that, okay, everything that you do here in the digital twin, if Mari goes ahead and sends me an email with her version of the digital twin, tells me, hey, Pedram, this is the location on the world that I want to deploy a wireless network system, whether it be outdoor and indoor. Now we have the tools to create that digital version of that physical world. Um, we are able to develop software with the hardware that we have on top of that, for example, AI applications that this one uh, was 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 talking about, or using all those you know accurate sensor information that comes from the physical world that Ahmed was talking about. We combine everything, we deploy the network, we come up with that solution, and then it will be containerized, and we can move it to power test with platforms. We can move it to another vendor who has or operator who have their own uh, hardware, and it's just completely virtualized and in a container package that you can move around um, in different locations. So this is this is our goal. And, you know, there are so many pieces of this that, you know, um, panelists in this call and so many other great researchers in the world are trying to solve little pieces of, you know, this, this puzzle. Uh, and the hope is, you know, everything will come together one day um, and then we'll have a fully realizable, you know, digital thing in real time. Thank you. 
Um, so we have about five minutes. So that's probably about one minute each. Um, so um, I wouldn't say what keeps you awake at night, because I'm sure all your research is keeping you um, awake at night. But um, about what you're doing now, what is the most exciting thing that's going to happen, I would say, in the next year? So I'll start with Istvan, because he's a new professor. Thank you. Uh, I would just go back to one of the remarks of Ahmed's who mentioned uh, energy efficiency being a big problem, of course, especially if you have resource constrained uh, uh, devices, that's that's an obvious uh, problem. So what we are, what keeps me awake, literally, uh, these days is uh, we're working on, 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 on the foundations of understanding how uh, digital twins can enable more sustainable systems, but also how can we make our digital twins more sustainable? Yeah. So if you deliver a system that's very much sustainable, but along the way you accumulate lots of sustainability debt, yeah, uh, it's you, you merely just mitigate it and move the problem from the problem to the process. So we are working on this bipartite notion of sustainability where you create digital twins in a sustainable fashion so that you can build sustainable systems. And sustainability here means your twin can evolve as you change the physical environment. You, your twin can be continuously reconfigured. Uh, you can build it in economic uh, economic ways. So it's 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 fast and reliable, the, the development process, but also the energy efficiency of the twin itself, because you might want to run it on, on, on a mainframe, right? But sometimes you, at some point you will have to push digital twins to the edge. So then it becomes a, a real problem. So this is what keeps me awake. And it's, you know, finding these, these, uh, these case studies in, in your, your community is just fantastic. Yeah. So this is basically my, <laughs> what keeps Ahmed. me awake. Ahmed, I hope you sleep better. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are like several really interesting research directions related to digital twins that we are looking at in the group. So all the way from understanding the, the actual gains, right, of the digital twins, if we, in, in, in this context that we are more interested in on the physical layer. So if you, you know, uh, with the gain, you know, in a, in a certain problem be like 20%, 30%, and then does this justify all the cost or, or is it like, you know, uh, 200, uh, you know, uh, you know, 200%, like, so, so, so we look at like theoretically understanding the the, the 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 actual gains of the digital twin in different problems. So this is one I think important aspect. And then uh, another aspect is just understanding also the different applications and use cases and potential of of digital twin and in, 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 in beam forming, channel compression, uh, other other venues. Um, and then exactly, I mean, if you if you would build these digital twin, and this is actually one one point also that I wanted to mention earlier is as I mean, for these digital twin in the context of real-time digital twin to be useful, we need them to be calibrated. So how can we design AI machine learning models that actually keep calibrating all these like different aspects of the modeling of the digital twin to get closer and closer to the real world? So these are all kind of very important, I think, problems to, 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 to address and we have been supporting. And Pedro, you get to close the whole thing and you have about one minute. First, thank you. I mean, uh, Spawn and Ahmed uh, brought all the great points. Um, energy efficiency, Spawn is is great. Uh, one of the things that we are thinking about is right now, you know, being able to measure uh, the, the the energy efficiency in the digital twin and make sure that in the real world also it, it makes sense because you know those are really consumed lots of energy, and that's our recent NTIA, uh, you know, funding that we are essentially working on that. And uh, back to Ahmad applications, of course, you know, this this is uh, what we think about every single day. Uh, what keeps me awake is writing proposals, just by the way. <laughs> I was up until three <laughs> last night, just to give me a sense. But it's all about digital twins. Uh, um, uh, you know, and 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 Mari, I'm sure that you appreciate the fact uh, this, this, will be, this will be my closing sentence. Everything that we do is towards uh, making open source an accessible environment for everybody, all the researchers and the community within the power platforms and the affiliated tested platforms such as Colosseum Marina and whatnot, making it open and accessible to everybody. And then, uh, you know, uh, promoting for having something reliable, that's high fidelity version of the real world so that researchers can develop, you know, uh, the great applications on top of it. Yeah, I think, I think that's, and it goes back to the first, I think at the beginning we're saying, you know, uh, if we have people who are very strong innovators and they would like to build these things, and they would like to test them and they would like to use them. They shouldn't have to, again, invest millions of dollars. We should be able to offer them that digital twin that will allow them to become, you know, the next big thing and wireless. 
Uh, we're out of time. Thank you so much to you three. Uh, I think uh, I hope the audience uh, enjoyed this these presentation as much as I did. Uh, we'll keep in touch, of course. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to Serge to have allowed us to, to do this. And thank you to the audience. Thank you for the questions that we had. And yes, uh, I think we're at the edge in this world of digital twins and, and wireless. And I think it's just like a really, really fun path to think. Thank you so very much, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.